see everyone? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hope you're well on this miserable rainy day that is outside. Huh? Good to see everybody here. We've learned so far that if we claim that God is one and God is our only true God, if we claim that we truly love him, then we have to do more than listen to what he says. We must obey what he says. The last time we were together, we, we spoke about how if we were to love God with all of our heart, we need to recognize that that's absolutely impossible if we don't understand God, because God is love. Yeah. We don't know how to love each other. We don't know how to love anybody else without the love of God. Today, we're going to look at what it means to love the Lord our God with all of our soul. I'm going to tell you about this, this lawyer who was in his office one day working on a court case and suddenly Satan appeared in front of him and Satan said to him, listen, I can make you win every single court case you ever have and I can make you one of the, the, the richest lawyers in the world, a multi-millionaire. He says, however, in exchange, I want your soul. I want your wife's soul. I want your children's soul. I want your parents' souls. I want your grandparents' souls. And I want the souls of all your friends. And the lawyer thought for a moment and said, well, what's the catch? And I guess the catch is that nobody really thinks about their souls these days, do they? When it comes to the soul. Moses says, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. So, before we get to the text, I think we need to ask the question, what is the soul? And hopefully when we answer that, that will uh, tell us how we can love God with all of our soul. You may remember the Apostle Paul, he says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here tells us that all human beings are triune beings. The Godhead is a triune being made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Paul says that humans too are made up of three elements. The body, the soul, and the spirit. Now we spoke about this not long ago in a study here, but can he uh, amplify that a little bit more? Because I think it fits in well with this uh, sermon. So, the body is of the earth and for the earth. So we may describe the body as earth conscience, in which the, it's, a, it's a physical tool in which our soul dwells, or our self dwells, and because that's our soul is invisible, we need something physical to live in a physical world. We see this with Jesus here more than anybody. Notice that although the Son existed with God in the beginning, it was necessary that the Word must become flesh or dwell among us. Tabernacle among us is the word he uses there. And so, loved ones, the, the, the Word needs to become flesh. Jesus needed a physical body. Why? Well, it's like Stephen's been talking about, and we just did with the Lord's Supper. He needed a physical body to come into the world so he could die for us. He needs a body to do that. Remember the Hebrew writer? <coughs> In fact, before we go to the Hebrew writer, Paul says here that without the human form that Jesus took upon himself, it would have been absolutely impossible for him to do the or fulfill the unique purpose of which he came in the first place. In other words, a crucifixion needs a body to be crucified to, a tree. And so Jesus needed a physical body for him to be able to do that. And that's why he came. And so the word must become flesh. And that was always a part of God's plan. You remember the first recorded words of Jesus? <coughs> we find them actually in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice is Jesus speaking, sacrifice not for as you did desire, but you prepared a body for me. You have no pleasure in whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll in the book, 
It is written of me to do your will, O God. Now that scroll is Psalm chapter 40, verse 6 through 8. Now notice the words here, a body you prepared for me. In other words, it was a part of God's plan that Jesus, the Christ, comes in human form. And he needed a body to do that. Hence, why God prepared that body for him. And what we're seeing here is that mankind is not just a bunch of chemicals. There's more to us than some people like to believe. Or way more to us. And so man is housed in this physical body. And since his body is designed to live on a physical earth, we know at death, the body returns to the earth. Dust to dust. Ashes to ashes, we might say. And that's probably the last words that we said when we pop our clogs. Yeah? Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Look at what Job says here. But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. And so if we understand our body to be earth conscience, a physical uh, element of us to live in a physical earth, we might think of the spirit as being God conscience. In other words, or conscious, in other words, it's the part of man's nature that, that reaches out to God. It's the part of us that, that wants to communicate with God. It's, it's, it's our spiritual dimension. And here we see the biggest difference. When God created us, we see the big difference between us and the animal world. This is what makes us unique. It's only man who's encouraged to say, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. It's only man who's encouraged to seek after him in the hope that they may feel him and feel after him and find him. It's only man who's got the assurance that he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. It's only man who has that assurance. Remember what Solomon said? Solomon says, the spirit returns to God who gave it. In other words, when a physical body go dies, it goes back to the dust. Because God created us from dust, didn't he? Our spirit goes back to God because he's the one who gave us it. We have no need for the spirit anymore. And so... What I'm saying is, again, is man is more than a bunch of chemicals. There's more to us than meets the eye. And then our soul is our self-conscience. The soul is man's unique self. It's who you are. Did you know this? A lot of people don't know this. But when you pop your clogs, you know, Danny, when he gets to heaven, he's still going to be Danny. Did you know that? He's still going to be the same person, the same personality, the same characteristics. That's what your soul is. It's you, yourself. And every one of us are going to be the same. And so when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to recognize each other because of those characteristics. You see, our soul is a part of which uh, uh, it makes us rational. It makes us moral. Our soul is the part that determines what the body does. Our soul is the part that renders us accountable for what we do in these bodies. And so it's man's soul which will ultimately be saved or ultimately go to hell. It's the soul that's going to go on forever. And it all depends on a person's response to the good news of Jesus. In other words, uh, our soul is the very part that needs to be dealt with here on planet Earth before we go to the next life. <coughs> it needs to be right with God. Our soul has to be right with God. Now, the Greeks, well, they thought of the soul of, of something that integrates the whole inside of us. In other words, if something is messed up in your soul, then your life is messed up. The Greeks also thought if you had bitterness or unforgiveness 
happening in your soul, then that would saturate everything in your life. And so to the Greeks, the soul is the very thing that tied the heart, the mind, and the strength all together. And what we're saying here is simply this. Loving God with all of our soul means to love him with our entire inner being. Look at the psalmist. Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Yes, my soul, find rest in God, my hope comes from him. And so to love God with all of our soul means to love God with all that I am. Let me ask you, are you doing that? Are we loving God with all of our will? Like Stephen mentioned earlier, his will be done, not mine. Are we loving God with all of our attitude, our intentions, our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, our body? That's what it means to love God with our entire inner life. I don't know about you, but I, for one, I don't know if anybody else has done this, but I, I, I have heard of other people. When, they, when, when you grow up, have you ever looked up into the night sky and thought, where did I come from? Have you ever had that thought? Have you ever had the thought, why am I here? And it's usually, you know, I did that before I became a Christian. I used to ask those questions a lot. And to be honest with you, I never really found an answer. And I, and I always found that my life was very empty at times. And that's why I was asking, why am I here? Because there was an emptiness. Well, you see, when God created us, he created us with this, this God-shaped hole within us, if you wish. And it can only be satisfied by him. And the people of the world, and even I did back then, turn to all kinds of things to fill that space. That's only for God, don't they? Whether it's drugs and alcohol or, or work, you know, whatever it is, they have affairs. People fill that space with everything except God. But that space can only be filled by God because God is the one who created that space. There's a part of our life that's for him and for him only because he only is the only one who fits in that space perfectly well. Listen to C.S. Lewis. He said, the mold of which a key is made would be a strange thing if you'd never seen a key. And the key itself a strange thing if you'd never seen a lock. Your soul has a curious shape because it's a hollow made to fit in a peculiar swelling in the infinite contours of the divine substance. Or a key to unlock one of the doors in the house with many mansions. Your place in heaven will seem to be made for you and you alone because you were made for it. Made for it stitch by stitch as a glove is made for a hand. Do you understand what he's saying? People are going everywhere to fill this gap that can only be filled with God. Our soul is so unique, it doesn't make any sense unless somebody placed it in us. And that's what he's telling us here. See, when we allow ourselves to go beyond just believing that God exists, our soul takes us much further than our hearts do. Our soul takes us into a solid relationship with the Father, and as a bonus, we get heaven. And that's what he's saying there. When you die and your soul goes to heaven, it will be like, this place was made for me. Your place. I go and prepare a room for you. Yeah? So it's very personal here, what Jesus is saying and what Jesus said there. And so, loving God with all of our soul means evaluating ourselves and, and, and working everything in our lives in accordance to God's will and asking ourselves, what does God want me to be? Remember what Paul said to the, the church in Corinth? He says, we're all being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory in other words when you become a Christian it's not just so that you can be saved we're supposed to grow 
We're supposed to be transformed. We're supposed to look more and more like Jesus. How about you? Do you look more like Jesus today than you did last week? Do you sound more like Jesus today than you did last week? Do you think more like Jesus today than you did last week? You see, God is trying to transform us. He's trying to change us. What about the characteristics and gifts and talents that you have? What is it about you that's set apart from everybody else in this congregation? How are you so different from everybody else? How is God using you to use your uniqueness to serve him and to bring other people to him? Are you using your uniqueness, your things like time, money, talent, energy? Are you using those things wisely and you're doing them for his good purpose? You see, what we're saying here is, if we believe we have a soul and God is changing us into the likeness of his son, we're asking the question, does your life represent Christ? That's a tough question, isn't it? Does your life represent Christ? You see, understanding ourselves and our own special uniqueness, your, your soul, yourself, who you are, when we do that through the help of others, and through the help of the Holy Spirit, then we can, we can achieve the, the goal that God wants us to achieve. And that is to become more and more like his son. You see, he change, he's changing our soul. He's not trying to change our physical appearance. That's what's inside he's trying to change. There was a wealthy man who was lying on his deathbed one time and he says to his wife, you know, I think I've come up with a way to take my money with me when I die. He says, I want, you, I want you to get some money together, put it in a large suitcase and put it in the attic. The idea was that when, when his soul departs from his body, he'll grab that suitcase and take it up to heaven with him. So his wife obliged and said, okay, I'll do that. So she did all that. And sooner or later, the man dies. Well, a few months later, she's up the attic. She's cleaning out, cleaning out the attic. And there it was, the suitcase with the money. And she said to herself, what an idiot. I know you should have put it in the basement. <laughs> you see, loved one, our soul is going to go on. The, the point is, what direction is our soul going to go on? We can't take anything with us. Everything around you is destined to come to an end. Your soul is the only part of us that's going to go on forever. Jesus, if you remember, asked a question. What good it would be for somebody to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Tough question. You see, Satan's got a whole bunch of stuff to offer you for your soul. But how valuable do you see your soul? You know, we've set ourselves a 30-day challenge to pray for all our loved ones, haven't we? And, and, and Lord willing, we're all praying for our loved ones every single day. Everybody's not just our own. Why? Because the soul is so important. That's why we're doing it, isn't it? The soul is important. Are you prepared for eternity? What's more important to you? Life on this planet or your soul? What's more important? Your family, your job your money, your wealth, or your soul. That's what Jesus is asking. And like I said, Satan has got a whole bunch of things he's willing to trade for your soul, like we saw at the very beginning with that man. A little boy was on his father's knee one time, and he says, Dad, is your soul insured? And the father said, what? He said, what are you talking about? He says, well, Uncle George says he believes you've got house insurance and he believes you've got life insurance, but he's not sure about your soul. He, he didn't want you to lose it. Will you, will you get your soul insured today? Isn't that incredible? People spend thousands of pounds 
on life insurance, house insurance, car insurance, mobile phone insurance, any other type of insurance you want to throw in, yeah, breakdown cover, <coughs> you've got boiler cover, and people spend thousands and thousands of pounds on all this material stuff, and yet they neglect the soul. They forget about the one thing that's going to last forever. Incredible. Let me finish up. You probably know this guy, or heard of him. Uh, Horatio Stanford is a, 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 a prominent American uh, lawyer who lived in the mid-19th century. He, in spite of his prominence, had major issues and circumstances that came along in his life. In 1871, for example, he, he <coughs> lost his only son, and he was only four years of age. A few years, well, Later that same year, there was a great fire broke out in Chicago, and so he lost his business. It was in shreds, literally burnt to the ground. Two years later, he was scheduled to travel to Europe, and so he decides to, to send his family ahead of him, and he will stay back in and fix whatever left of his business. Well, while crossing the Atlantic uh, Ocean, his family went on ahead, but the ship his family was on collided with another sailing ship. And that thing sank rapidly. Tragically, all four of Spafford's remaining children, his four daughters, drowned at sea. Only his wife, Anna, survived. And when she got back to safety, she sent back what is now a, a world-famous a telegram, if you wish, with the words saved alone. Think about that for a moment. Here's a guy who lost his only son, lost his business, a couple of years later loses his four daughters, and only his wife is left. I don't know about you, but I can't even imagine to begin or even begin to imagine what that man went through and how he must have felt. But as some of you know, that that didn't crush the guy. It didn't crush Horatio. In fact, shortly after the news of the tragedy, he boarded a ship to go and meet his grieving wife. And as that ship passed the very spot where his four daughters died, he was inspired to write a song that are sung all over the world even today. You know the name of the song, don't you? It is well with my soul. How is your soul doing today? Don't you want to get to that, that point in our lives that no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going to go through, don't you want to get to that point in your life that you could always say, it is well with my soul. Don't you, don't you want to get there? Here is a guy who loved God with all of his soul. He's living proof of what it means. And so I like this guy's song, this, this, the words, the prayer. We can make it a prayer for us this morning as we finish up, just to think about that so that we too can look back and look forward and think, I don't care what's going to come in our life. I'm going to love God with all my soul. And that's the place where we need to be. God bless you.